got your Bible, uh, turn to Luke chapter 19. And as you get there, please stand to your feet as we read the scriptures this morning. Um, if you're watching online, you can just pretend or put feed emojis or something that you're standing. But we're going to read Luke chapter 19, verse, start at verse 28. And as you get there, rather than seeing Jesus' triumphant entry for what it was, it was a fulfillment of prophecy. Many, including the religious leaders, were so concerned about keeping their own power and authority that they missed the Messiah. So it, it is possible to be close to religion, but to miss God. I'm going to say that again for the people in the back. It is possible to, to be in religion, be close to religion, but miss God. And so my heart this morning and my goal this morning is to persuade you to believe that you don't have to miss the moment anymore. So let's read. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem, Jesus. When he drew near Bethpage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where, you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it, you shall say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus. And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down, highlight that, underline that, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for the Almighty, for all the mighty works that he had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the, these very stones would cry out. Just a side note, at that moment, he was passing a graveyard, and he was saying, if I silence the crowd from praising me, these bones in the grave were going to shout. So that, nah, he was just saying random rocks. He was saying these actual people that are buried here will cry out. I titled the message, I'm not missing the moment anymore. Why don't you tell the person next to you, I'm not missing the moment anymore. If you're online, type that. I'm not missing the moment anymore. You can be seated. Come on, I'm not missing the moment anymore. <laughs> I'm not missing. Have you ever been in a moment, we understand moment at a short period of time. Have you ever been in a moment but not understand the gravity of the moment? Maybe like you're walking into a room where a conversation has been had and you, you walk in and you can tell it was a heavy conversation but it was too, it's too late because you've already interrupted that moment. And you're like, oh gosh, I got a backpedal now. Or, you know, I think, of, I think of conversations that, you know, when me and my wife are talking, and it's about adult things, and in comes my daughter, Stella. And you're like, you missed the moment, girl. We're having a conversation. Is it just me? We've all done that. We've all missed the moment, like uh, failure to read the room. I have, I have learned how to slow down and read the room. I have learned how not to just barge in and make myself known. I've learned to quietly read the room. And there's been some growing pains. There have been a lot of growing pains. I've missed a moment a lot in my life. I've missed it when I should have said something and I didn't. You know, when I should have done something and I did not. I've missed a moment in my life when I should have said something, when I should have done something, when I should have moved and I froze. I've missed moments when I should have paid attention and I didn't. I've missed moments. Have you missed moments? We've all struggled with this at one time or another. I think in our humanity, our world is so busy and fast paced that we miss moments that are significant. And then we look back and go, man, I, why wasn't I there? We look at 
Polaroid pictures, you know, or we look at pictures and photo albums. I still print out my pictures. So, or you, you may scroll back on your, on your phone and look at pictures from years ago or somebody showing you an event on a family photo album and you're wondering, where was I? Oh, you were there, but you were busy. You were in another room doing something. You missed that moment to reflect. I know I've missed the moment. I wonder if there's anyone here that's ever missed the moment. Come on. Maybe you've missed the graduation because you were busy and you regret it. Maybe you missed that conversation or that moment in that conversation. You've missed it because you were distracted. Maybe you've missed that open door because you were uncertain or oblivious that the door was for you. We've all missed open doors. Amen? You've missed the moment. I've missed the moment. Maybe you've missed the prophetic moment of God. Maybe in your life you've been in a, in, a, in a service God speaks to you clearly and you ignore it. Or you decided that day, I'm not even going to church. I'm not even going to go to that gathering. I'm not even going to, I don't even want to hear what the word of God says today. And you miss, and then people go, you miss church? There was a move. Right? That's happened. I remember when I was younger and the Lord, I was in a youth service and I had a good relationship with the pastor at the time, and he said, hey, he knows that I can flow in the prophetic, and, and he said, hey, if God speaks to you during worship or you get a vision, just come up to me, or, and I'll give you the mic. And uh, we do that here. If, you get, if God gives you a vision or a word, you come to the pastor, the one that's kind of dictating where the service, sensing where the service should go, and, and, you, and you pick that up, and he discerns whether it's for the service or for just for you. And sometimes uh, I went up and I shared prophetic words, and he goes, that's more for you. And I go, all right, cool. I'll write that down in my journal. The next day or next time, he God speaks to me. But there was this one specific time where there was this moment that I missed, this prophetic moment for the, for the, for the youth ministry at the time. And God gave me a vision, and I was sitting in the chair, and it was this clear vision. And, and I couldn't shake it. I was trying to, like, maybe it was bad Chinese or a movie that I saw or something that just kept, like, Dominant, dominating my mind. I'm like, but this is powerful what I'm seeing. And worship's going, and I'm like, nah, that's me. Nah. And I just, Lord, I know this is you, but I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say anything. I'm not gonna do anything. I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna sit here. And lo and behold, a young lady gets up on the other side of the room, grabs a microphone, shares a vision, same as what I had. And I'm sitting there like, but you're missing details. And I was so upset at myself because I was like, man, why didn't I just step out in faith and encourage? Why did I miss that moment? What would have God, what, what could God have done in me in that moment? We've all missed prophetic moments. There's been moments here as your pastor. Remember in the beginning of this year, there was a moment in which uh, we were worshiping and God spoke to me and he said, I want to pour out my spirit. And I said, amen, praise God. And he said, no, I need you to lead this. I need you to go up and say da 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 And I sat in my chair, and I was like, nah. They ain't going to receive that. And he said, I don't, I want to move. I want to blow in here. And I was like, <laughs> but Lord, and here, 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 here comes the root of what he was dealing in me insecurity. Well, what if I miss it? What if I don't say the right thing? But God, what if, what if, what if, and what if? So I get up, and I had a wrestle. This is the beginning of January. And I go, I open up my notes, and I blew past that moment. And I went in the back, and I journaled. And I just let it out. After the service was done, it was great, powerful, praise God. I went to the back, and I just started writing my thoughts down, and and, and realized the root of it was I was insecure. And I said, man, sometimes insecurity will rob you of the moment. It will rob you of that, that God wants to pour into you and use you and speak through, speak through you, but you're too busy looking at yourself and how you sound or whatever. And so I got confronted by the Holy Spirit. And that was right before prayer and fasting. And so we went into a prayer, to, uh, prayer and fasting, 15 days of prayer and fasting. If you remember this year, 
And the Lord said, I'm going to rip out that insecurity in your life. And I said, yes, rip it out. So now if I get kooky or if I get uh, a little bit bold and audacious, that's just me stepping out in faith and obeying the Lord. If, if it bothers you, you know, I'm sorry. You can, uh, you know, there's some churches, some good churches in this area. Praise God. <laughs> but I'm accountable to him. I'm accountable to him. And I'm, he's, he's so gracious to us. How many times have we missed that opportunity or that moment to step in, to partner with God, to do what he desires to do in this moment, in this brief moment? You've had moments all week. But God spoke to you. And you have the choice to listen and obey or ignore. You have the choice. So did I. We miss moments. That's what I want to open up and show common, commonality in the room. We all miss moments. Shoulda, coulda, woulda. And we can, a regret can kind of stir up in our hearts. I'm going after regret. There's no regret. We're not missing the moment anymore. Say that with me. I'm not missing the moment anymore. There was a moment happening in our text as we read today. A very powerful moment that was happening. Jerusalem was buzzing. There were millions of people arriving into the city. The volume of the town was high. You think I'm loud when I shout. It was loud in Jerusalem. People were filled with joy and praise and spontaneous reading of scriptures. They were, they were walking and, and declaring and just enjoying the atmosphere. It was a great occasion. Why, though? Well, because people would come from near and far. God's people would come to Jerusalem, especially during this time of year, for, for Passover. They would come for Passover. They would travel. They had, they had caravans of people coming. It was, a festive, it was a festive event, and it would take place throughout the week, so they didn't want to miss Passover Friday, so they would get here. Some would get here Monday and Tuesday. And there was always this group of exciting people that would come in caravans. Families and families coming from this part of the country and this part of the country, they would gather, and, and you would see families come and, and worship, and, and they would have their sacrifices ready, or... They would have their money ready to buy sacrifices. And we see, if you continue reading, Jesus, how he felt about that. They, would, they were coming to, to get forgiveness of their sins, and I think that that's very powerful. And Jerusalem was on a hill. It was a city on a hill. So it was high. And there was a road that led up to Jerusalem, into the city. And at the bottom of this road... The people would arrive, and they would get to the bottom of this road, and they would begin to ascend the road. And while they ascend the road, they would, they would read and sing the Psalms of Ascent. That's in Psalms 120 through 134. I encourage you this week to read those Psalms this week. But they would read each Psalm, and they would sing the Psalms of Ascent. They would be at the bottom, Psalm 120. Then they would go to Psalm 121. Then they would go to Psalm 122. And, Psalm, and it, would, it would take them, by the time they got to the very top of that hill, they would be singing Psalm 134. And they would be joined by a chorus of people that are just worshiping and would sing the song with them and welcoming them and saying, yes, the King of Zion, yes, Yahweh, yes, he's awesome, yes, he's great. And they would celebrate, and it was, it was a great occasion. They made it to the top. They sang all the songs. They're professing the word of God. It was amazing. And this yearly event that took place would serve to solidify the faith of God's people. I am a, I, I am a, uh, I'm a part of Yahweh's Line, I, we are his people. That's what they would be declaring. They would affirm their faith. That's what was happening. That's the atmosphere. That's the moment that Jesus steps into. Now, he's done Passover two years before, but this year is different. Jesus enters Jerusalem. He's literally fulfilling prophecy. Literally. He's riding into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, this is the only uh, recorded occurrence where he actually, in all of the Gospels, where he actually rode on something. He normally walked everywhere. But this is the first time recorded he rode on something. And this, 
significant detail, it lies in that he was fulfilling a prophecy in Zechariah 9.9. It says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. You see that? Think about this. Hundreds of years prior to this moment, God prophesied, I'm coming and I'm going to ride on a donkey. And now Jesus, realizing his moment, this is it, this is the time, he goes to get the donkey and fulfill that word in which he spoke hundreds of years before through the prophet Zechariah. He intentionally fulfilled prophecy. Say amen. amen. Now why a donkey? Now a king riding, I love that what you said in transition, when he returns, he's returning on a horse. Because when a king riding into the city on a horse generally communicated war. And we know he's coming back. But when a king rode in on a donkey, that signified peace. Jesus was communicating that he was a different kind of king. That he was a, that he was a different kind of savior. He's the prince of peace. You and I, we serve a different kind of king. Unlike the world, unlike, hey, you can name it and claim it, you can have it all you want. No, 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 we serve a good, peaceful warrior king. That's the king that we follow. That's the, when you say, Jesus, have your way, victory is yours, you're the prince of peace. Not only is he never frazzled, not only is he never panicked, he brings peace with him. So he takes the frantic in your life and he brings peace to it when he's in your life. When he's in your heart, when he's in your mind, this is what he does. Now, in the text that we read, we didn't see palm branches because that was recorded in Mark. And I was going to bring palm branches this week, but, you know, I decided against that next, maybe next year. So we have palm and branches. So everybody show me your palm branches if you can. There you go. Palm branches. Praise God. All right. So the imagery of palm branches, it was a part of the Jewish culture, and it, it often reflected honor and nobility. And in 1 Kings chapter 6 and 7, when Solomon built the temple, he inlaid as part of the, the final details, he, he carved in palm branches in the temple. So it means something. So in Mark's account, when Jesus entered, people are spreading palm branches out on the ground along with their cloaks. It wasn't just cloaks, cloaks and palm branches. And what I imagine to be some kind of an ancient red uh, rug red carpet like an annual red carpet and they would they would it would probably help keep the dust down too as he was walking right they're just laying down and they're they're shouting praise and they're worshiping but here's a detail that I want to just bring out this week as Jesus was riding the colt outside of the city everybody say outside he was on his way down Mount Olivet and he has yet to ascend to the city gates. He was on his way down. Everybody say on his way down. He was on his way to the city. Sometimes, and I heard God speak to this, the palm leaves were laid on the floor on the way to the city. Worship was happening. Honor was happening on the way. Everybody say on the way. Sometimes you got to learn to worship God when your miracle is on the way. Sometimes you got to learn to worship God when your peace is on the way. We have to become a people that say, God, I may not feel it now. I may not, I may not be in this moment, but I do know one thing. You are on the way. Your peace is coming. Joy is coming. Love is coming. Faith is coming. I may be struggling right now, but I'm going to believe. I'm going to hold fast and believe you are on your way. They were worshiping him when he was on his way. Come on. That's so profound sometimes we just wait for the good to happen in our lives to worship but how about worship in the waiting how about you war in the waiting when things aren't happening and manifesting the way you want how about we learn how to worship and believe and use our faith to say God I, I don't feel you now but I know you're with me I know you're on your way so powerful and the significance of this moment of honor that they paid to Jesus with the palm branches, it foreshadows what's to come. Because in Revelation, you can write the scripture in Revelation chapter 7, Revelation chapter 7 verse 9, 
there's an incredible description of worship that includes palm branches. So we see Jesus in this moment is fulfilling a prophecy of Old Testament prophecy, but he's also pointing forward towards an even greater scene of worship that is yet to come. And it's going to happen because our king is returning. Our king is returning. That sounds better than Lord of the Rings, right? Turn of the king. <laughs> no, our king is returning. And there will be worship. And there will be exaltation. There will be praise. There will say, so even, even now, we worship while we wait. Come, Lord Jesus, come. We worship when we don't see. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Lord, I don't feel it, but I trust you. I don't see it, but I know you're here. I know that you're coming. Your word says you're coming. You are not a, a liar. You are not a man that you should lie. You are a fulfiller. You are truthful, and you are returning. I don't know when. You know when. Only the Father knows when. So when you come, find me waiting and find me worshiping. Find me working. Find me serving. Find me loving you. Find me at your feet. Don't find me wandering. Don't find me lollygagging. Find me at your feet. Find me worshiping. Come on. So Jesus, once he comes down and he gets to that bottom part of the hill, he starts to ascend this hill. Now remember, there are people ascending the hill already. Jesus gets to the hill. He starts to ascend the hill on the, on the colt, on the donkey. He hears and he sees people reciting the psalm of ascent. He sees the millions of people, the crowds. He can sense the joy in the atmosphere. The little boy, he can see holding his, his sacrifice. He can see the hardworking father pulling his calf. He can see the sacrificing woman of valor singing her heart out. He can see even the religious man quiet his soul as he reads Psalm 134 out loud. The atmosphere was set. They were worshiping and praising the king. Yet, right after he reaches the top of the city, the top of the hill, and he sees the city, he doesn't, where the crowd goes, yes, Psalm 134, and they're singing Psalm 134, and they're celebrating. Everybody's celebrating. Jesus doesn't celebrate. He doesn't go, Yay! It says he sees the city and begins to weep. Weep? He sees that city. In that moment, he begins to weep. Look at this. Uh, we'll read this again from the passage translation. When Jesus caught sight of the city, he burst into tears with uncontrollable weeping over Jerusalem. It's hard to see a weeping Savior. What grieved him so much? What was it that made him burst into tears? And he says, if only you could recognize that this day peace is within your reach, but you cannot see it. See, they missed him. They missed the moment. The faithful believers of Yahweh and are praising the Lord and they're honoring and they're worshiping and yet they, they don't notice that there's a king in their presence. They missed him. They missed the moment. They were excited about making the journey. They just couldn't see that there is a king, the one that you're foretelling about, the one that you're singing about in the songs of a saint. He's right here. You missed him. And that grieved him. Again, I submit to you, it's possible to be close to religion and yet still miss God. It's possible to, to play church. It's possible to say all the right things and yet still miss God. And that's a scary thing for me. And I think back when, when it's all said and done, in the moment when Jesus comes and, and we stand before him, there's a scripture, I believe, in Matthew that says, when we stand before Jesus at the throne of judgment, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus will look at us and go, depart from me, for I never knew you. And there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I go to myself, I go, wait a minute. 
But these people said, Bob, I'm prophesying in your name. I laid hands in your name. I ministered in your name. I did this in your name. I did that in your name. I did it all for you. And he says, depart from me. You practice lawlessness. I don't know you. I never knew you. What? So this, this idea is saying we could be so wrapped up in religious duties that we could miss relationship with the Savior. We could miss intimacy with Jesus because we're too busy working for him that we don't even know him. More importantly, he says, I never knew you. So we don't make ourselves available to him. What we're struggling with, what we're, come on. I want to hear a good message. Listen, this is good because, because this, we have to realize that we're normal when we miss moments. They had the king, the savior, right before him, and yet they still missed him and didn't realize who was there. They're singing about him, and he's like, hello, I'm right here. How often do we do that? It's possible to be close to religion and be far and yet miss God. Listen, when you receive prescription glasses, they're only helpful if the prescription is correct. If it's not correct, it'll be, your view will be limited, you'll have headaches, and it'll still be blurry, right? My glasses wear contacts, people say amen. My wife put on my contacts the other day, and she's like, man, it's still blurry. But she didn't know it was my contacts. And I was like, you probably got my contacts on. <laughs> she's like, I do. <laughs> she told me later that that's the second time she's done that. <laughs> If we're not, in the same way, if we're not viewing the reality of our salvation and our life through Jesus' finished work and what he's done on the cross, and we look at our religious actions, our good works as our filter, we lack the, we'll lack the ability to see God moments in our lives. We have to look through the lens of the finished work of Christ, not at the lens of of the fact that you're such a good servant and a Christian. Don't miss the moment. So how did, how did it happen? How do, how do they miss it? How do we miss it? Back then, most, most people at that time have seen and heard about Jesus. They have, they have heard the miracles that he performed. They've seen the miracles he performed. Most have heard him crying out, repent and believe for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Because that was his message. He would say, repent and believe for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Many of the religious leaders knew the prophecies concerning Jesus and even witnessed a lot of them being fulfilled before their very eyes. At this time, this is the third Passover where Jesus is riding in. Jesus' fame preceded him. He, he had the check on Instagram. If you're an Instagram person, he, he was popular. In fact, if you follow his life, everywhere he went, multitudes would be there waiting for him. Crowds would gather and wait for him. His fame preceded him, yet they missed him. How many times have you missed something because you were busy texting or watching TV or doing something on the internet, whatever? How many of you missed moments? I have. I remember when I was uh, in college and I was doing math, and Stella was walking. First service, I said she was a newborn, and she was walking, and that was weird. But she was, I don't know, a toddler. And I was doing math, praise God for math, and I was sweating and focused on math. And I'm ah, focused, and she comes in, and she's tugging on my leg, Papa, Papa, and I'm like, and I got annoyed. And I picked her up, and I put her in the, in the kitchen, and closed the door, leave me alone. Don't you know this algorithm is driving me nuts? And the Holy Spirit checked me. You just missed a moment. So I get up, and I go and I grab her, close the door, and I put her on my lap. What do you want, babe? I'm sorry I was busy. She just wanted to give me a kiss and tell me she loved me. And the Lord said, you're going to miss that moment. So I needed that love and that kiss. So I take her, and then she does her thing. I would like to say that I always do that. I'm always that sensitive of a man for the Spirit of God to speak to me and, and catch myself when I miss a moment. I can always say, I, can, I would love to say that, you know, I can catch, you know, when, when my wife needs something, I'm sensitive enough to pick up on it. 
I would love to say that. In fact, I'm going to say it in faith. <laughs> but I'm not. Yet. She texts someone to say that. Yet. <laughs> but I'm not yet. We, we, we all miss moments. We, maybe there's, there's important conversations and details that you miss from a person sharing their heart to you or somebody's opening up to you and God wants to speak through you to them, but you're too busy thinking about something else and you miss that moment to pour into that person that'll help them and lead them. Amen? Jesus wants to enter your life and transform the very way you view life. The very way we view life. And, at, and are we missing it because we're not paying attention? My plea to you this morning is that you pay attention so you don't miss the moment anymore. God wants to use you on your job. God wants to use you in your neighborhood. God wants to use you in your family as his mouthpiece, as his hands, as his feet. But I don't know enough. You don't need to know enough. You need to know him and say, yes, Lord, whatever you want me to say. I would take young teenagers out evangelizing who knew nothing and I would say, hey, just ask people if they want prayer. And if they do pray, ask them if they want Jesus. Lead them to Jesus. Okay. All right. I did the same thing with adults. Now, I need the steps of how to lead and pray for people. How do you... Now, are we asking them to ABC? Can I get a printout <laughs> of, a, of a way to pray for people... That one. Are we going to hold signs on the corners? Uh, but you ask, when I took teenagers out, they're like, let's go. Knocking on doors. Boom, 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 boom. Hey, you need prayer? Yeah. All right. Come to the door. I'll pray for you. This is before COVID. They had beer thrown at them. Praise God. I smell like beer. Michelob. They had, but they also had moms weeping on their porch. They also had people going in to buy a bag of chips at a grocery store, but walking out with salvation. They also had this boldness and about them because there was no, there was, there was no playing, there was no formality. They weren't going to miss the moment. And I think there's so many opportunities for you every single day, not only to miss to engage God, but allow God to use you to engage others. Don't miss the moment. This weekend is the easiest way. This is the Super Bowl weekend coming up for churches. Easiest way to have God use you to reach people. Amen? So, how do we all live this out? Very practical things, and, and, and I'll be wrapping up here. Number one, we prioritize what's important. What are you not willing to fail at? How can we make sure we don't miss the moment anymore in our lives? Prioritize what's important. And I put this here, what are you not willing to fail at? Because that helps me. I'm not willing to fail at first being a follower of Jesus. So if anything tries to rob that from me, I cut it off. I'm not willing to fail at being a husband. I'm willing to fail at being a friend. I'm willing to fail at being the best athlete. I'm willing to fail at having the perfect bod. I'm willing to fail at those things at the, at the expense of I'm not willing to fail at my walk with the Lord, my family. I'm not willing to fail at that. So I will cut what I need to cut off. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes I drift and my priorities get out of whack. But I get reminded, God, I don't want to miss you. I want to keep the first things first. So that's my encouragement to you with that. The second thing you can do, very practical, is to spend less time on media. More time praying. Reading our Bible. Talking to our children about God. I think I have number two up there. Go ahead. There you go. Reading our Bible, talking to our children about God, and participating in discipleship-based community or life groups. So prioritize, spend less time on media. I did something this week that 
because I, as I was pondering this message and making it flesh it out, I took off social media off my phone. Just a simple thing. I said, I don't want to have Facebook or any of that stuff on my phone. Some of you don't have that on your phones. You're, you're ahead of the game. Some of us got sucked in. I was a former youth pastor. I had to, to keep track of these little kids. I had Snapchat, and I deleted it. I said, no, nah, that's too ratchet for me. But I took that off my phone, and this is what I was doing. I found myself doing this this week. I'd open up my phone. And I'd scroll aimlessly, looking at nothing. Just, well, normally I would check out what's going on here. I, I took it off my phone. I don't want to read down, but I found myself constantly gravitating to this thing. Is anybody here with me? And so when I took it off, I, you know what I discovered? I got more time. I was robbing a focus, robbing of things I had to do or things that I can focus on. And one of the things I needed this week was to focus on my relationship with the Lord. It sounds like, man, God, help me out. So I want to challenge you. Maybe spend less time on media and spend less time in front of the TV. Spend time praying. Spend time re cracking open your Bible, putting the Word of God on the inside of you, talking to your children about God. Have you had conversations with them about their faith? Talk to your friends about God. Get connected. Don't make excuses anymore. Say, man, I'm going to feed my faith. Amen? The third thing, assess whether you've traded righteousness for self-righteousness easy to do that. Are you missing Jesus like the religious leaders? You're saying the right thing, but you're still missing it because you're too concerned where your seat is in church or politics in church or whatever. Sometimes these things can get in the way and we can become arrogant and self-righteous. So assess your heart. Holy Spirit, have I been self-righteous? God, I I don't want, it's not about me. I, I, you make me righteous, so I got to spend time with you. Amen? And the fourth thing is pursue Jesus by caring for what he cares for. Simple. Th this would allow you not to miss the moment. Pursue Jesus, because if you're at, if you're pursuing him closely, when he goes left, you go left. You don't miss that moment. When your devotional life is rich, when you're really spending time in his word, in his presence, when you're hearing him, when he speaks, you speak. What he says, you record. When he says go, you don't hesitate. There's this, there's this quick response when you're that close. But when you're caught up in yourself and in your stuff and in my stuff, he can be in our very midst. He can be standing right before we could be talking about him, but still miss him. How? How is that? Because he knows when we're pretending and when we're acting. He knows us. He knows you. The Pharisees were great actors. My heart, Lord, if there's any self-righteousness in me, any hypocrisy in me, help me. Show me. We're all on a journey. This is not to pass judgment on each other. This is to do self-assessment. Lord, look at me. Where am I? Am I really intimate with you? Am I, do I really allow myself to be known by you? Or is it all just a show? Is it all just a show? These are things that I wrestle with as a man. I say, Lord, would you look at my heart? I'm fairly a quiet dude most of the week. My wife would attest to that. And most of my thoughts and my ponderings are reflected in my attitude. And when I'm wrestling through things, I have a bad attitude. When I'm when I'm feeling great, I have a good attitude. So, you know, I was journaling and having my quiet time with the Lord. And I said, Lord, man, help me to reflect you in my attitude, in my thoughts. Help me, Lord, to not miss what you want to do because I'm too busy doing what I want to do. As we get ready to enter into Holy Week, this is the first day of Holy Week, my prayer is that this week, you spend more time than you ever have with him. More time in your word. 
You reassess your priorities. You stop making excuses for yourself. You get up earlier if you have to. You stay up later if you have to. You do whatever you can. To sit at his feet and remember what he's done for you. Because he's worth it. And he's good and he deserves it. We get the benefit of having a relationship with him now. And we get the benefit of seeing him in eternity face to face. And I want to stand before him. And I don't want him to say, I never knew you. I want him to say, hey, what's up? Come here. Yes, Lord. I love you. I know. Come on. It's the one goal of my life. To know him and make him known. Why don't we stand to our feet? Let me pray for you today, friend. If you're watching online, I want to pray for you as well. Father, I just come before you. I thank you for your word. Thank you for this moment, this specific moment that you made and you wrote down and you set up for those watching and those in this room. Lord, if there's anyone here who has not put their faith in you, Holy Spirit, draw them to repentance. Draw them to repentance. Help them to put their faith in you. Show them they're a sinner in need of for the Savior. Jesus, I pray for my brothers and my sisters and my friends. I ask you, Lord, make them sensitive that they don't miss a moment with you anymore. There's too much to, to do for you. There's too, too many people that need to know you. Help us not to miss a moment with you. I pray that you would give them ears to hear, eyes to see what you are doing, ears to hear what you are saying. All the days of their life, make their hearts sensitive to you and their voice gentle like yours. Anoint the work of their hands and be with them all the days of their life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone says amen. 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 Hey, if you need ministry today, I'm going to ask my life group leaders to come up. We're going to continue just to play. And, but if you need prayer, my life group leaders will pray for you. But if not, I want you to enjoy your day. Spend as much time as you can with Jesus. And remember, you're the head and not the tail. Above, not beneath. Righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Salt of the earth, light of the world. Go and take Jesus to all generations. God bless you. Have a great Sunday. We love you.